Thanks for coming, everybody. Uh, my name is Bob Stiegel, and I'm here to talk about some work that I did recently on uh, multi-threaded access to uh, containers. And uh, as it turns out, the end result was sort of a transactional algorithm, so I called the talk a multi-threaded transaction-based uh, read-write locking strategy for containers, which is quite a mouthful, and uh, I hope the algorithm lives up to the title. As always, this talk is proudly sponsored by the American East Const Association of America. Okay, to keep the silliness alive. All right, so really the talk is about sharing a container amongst multiple threads. Uh, and specifically, a more difficult case, which is sharing a, a container among multiple threads who are all trying to write to the container simultaneously. And in the case of the work that I've done here so far, that container is vector. Uh, I'm going to discuss a motivating problem, something that I started working on about uh, nine or ten months ago, which led me down this path of, of developing this algorithm. Uh, I'll briefly touch on some possible solutions to the motivating problem that I'm going to describe. And then the bulk of the talk is going to be uh, discussing the algorithm, which is a solution that's based on a, on a concept from uh, database design called strict timestamp ordering. Uh, I'll, pre I'll present some, some test code in order to hopefully convince you that the, the algorithm has been uh, tested and is possibly correct. And then uh, finally, I'll, I'll do a little summary. Now, just to set expectations, I'm not a database designer and I'm not an expert at concurrency. I, you know, I don't even play that on TV. Uh, so if you ask me any super difficult concurrency problems uh, while I'm standing on the stage, the probability of getting an incorrect answer is very, very close to one. All right. So sharing a container. Sometimes you have a situation where you want to share a container between threads. And sometimes you want to write to that container. And again, in, in this context, it's a vector. So we want to avoid race conditions while we are writing to the elements of the container. For the purposes of this talk, let's assume that all of the elements in the container are themselves unsynchronized. In other words, they don't, the, the container elements don't have lock, unlock member functions. They're just regular old classes that are thread unaware. So let's build some rules for how to avoid races in this case. Well, the first rule is that and this is by no means perhaps the correctly stated and perfect set of rules, but it seems like it makes sense to me. The first rule is that exactly one thread may update an element at any given time. So you can't have a situation where two threads are, are attempting to access or update the same element because that's a race condition. No other thread can read the contents of an element while that writer is updating it. But if no one is updating the element, then more than one thread can read that element. Now, with C++11 and beyond, we have a wealth of concurrency uh, tools at our disposal, and it's often been said that writing multi-threaded applications is easier than ever. I'm not really sure. They always seem difficult to me. Okay, so in the easy case, all of our threads are readers and no locking is required. Now, if the number of readers is much larger than the number of writers, we might be able to use a solution where we use a reader's writer lock, like a, a stood shared mutex. Um, and multiple readers can all access it, and when the writer needs to write to it, the readers wait for him, and he, he does his, his update, and then releases it, and the readers go and, and, and do their thing. If you're working on something like a, a data structure to answer queries for DNS, where you might be doing uh, 10 to 100 million reads for every single write, a situation like this might make sense. But what about the case where most of your operations are writes? Well, you might be able to get away with the per element mutex strategy. However, that might work if a given write operation requires locking exactly one element at a time. It might work. But what about the case where all of your operations are writes? You never actually read the container. And 
each element E that needs to be updated is somehow related to a set R sub E of other elements that are part of that container. As an aside, let's call this set E's related group. And furthermore, let's define another set called the update group, which is the set union of E and R sub E. So the update group, U sub E, is the set of all of the elements, including E, that need to be updated to, to do this write operation to this container. And one or more elements in R sub E must be updated at the same time and consistently with E. And the number of elements in R sub E varies from right to right. And the membership of R sub E varies from right to right. Right? This is enough to make you wish you'd taken that JavaScript job. Alright, so what's a motivating problem for this? The problem that I was facing was one of a reactive message processor. This is a, an object which received a continuous stream of input messages. It generated output only when something interesting happened. In other words, a history of some sort needed to be maintained in order to detect relevant changes between one input message and the next. I never needed to read the state of the history. Every message that was an input to the system was a write operation into the history. And by the way, the history used one or more containers. I can't talk about the specific problem, but a small number of containers that had elements that were related to each other. So what does this look like? Well, it's pretty easy. I have some source of input messages. It feeds into an event loop and a message processor that goes to some evaluator function. The evaluator function inserts the new message into the history and then queries the history object to see has it an interesting difference occurred. If so, in that case, I'm going to send a message out to a sync somewhere. And that's the, that's the problem, right? Well, this is all well and good and it's easy to do in a single thread. But then your manager comes to you and says, it must scale to multiple threads, right? So you have a situation that looks like this. Now you have some input source like Kafka or something, and you have multiple nodes running on multiple, uh, you know, maybe multiple systems or multiple threads in this case, each of which is doing an independent value evaluation of a message, and they're all reading and writing into the same historical store, right? Every one of those write operations into the historical store needs to be synchronized so that there are no race conditions. So thinking about this, you know, and I had some small experience in the past at a previous job. For a few months, I worked on an in-core uh, in ACID database. Uh, three of the four requirements for an ACID database are apl applicable here. The first is that we want the modification of an update group to be tr treated as a single transaction. In other words, updating whatever elements of the update group need to be changed should be done atomically, where all updates succeed completely or they fail completely. Every time a transaction occurs, it should bring the state of the update group from one valid state to another, and all of the invariants amongst those elements in the update group and with the surrounding container should be maintained. Finally, we want the solution to be isolated. Each transaction has to ensure that the concurrent execution of some other transaction leaves its update group and the container in the same state that would have been attained if the transactions were executed in some sequential order, some valid sequential order. So the idea is, is that you don't know what order transactions are going to commit and complete in, but whatever order that is, there should be some equivalent set of operations that you can determine which would, be, which would give you the equivalent result if they were all executed uh, in a single thread. And in this particular problem, I didn't need the D from ACID. I didn't need durability, which is why it's not up there. So what are some possible solutions? Well, one solution is sharding, right? You can take the elements of the container and you can divide it into a set of individual independent shards such that the members of every elements update group uh, are also part of that shard. In this case, uh, you can schedule things such that Updates to each shard are performed by one thread that's dedicated to servicing that shard, right? So if you've got a bunch of elements and you've got eight cores and you can divide your elements into eight shards, 
you can apply one core to each shard and it, it uh, is responsible only for that. And as long as update groups never cross shard boundaries, you effectively can get single threaded performance out of that situation. The same performance you would have uh, in a single thread, you've, you've scaled it up by eight because there's no, there's no conflict. There's no need to lock any elements in that case. The downside to this approach is there's some increased complexity, right? Uh, and it only works if the data is amenable to being sharded. If you can't shard your data, this is not going to work, right? So this applies to special cases of data. Well, another solution, a per container mutex. Let's instantiate a mutex for the entire container and perform updates in a single critical section that's guarded by that mutex, right? Well, it works. It's easy to understand and it's easy to think about. The obvious downside is that it does not scale very well, right? Well, how about per element mutexes, right? Let's add a mutex to every element and let's acquire the mutexes for all the elements in the update group. And when we're done updating, we'll release all of the mutexes, right? Well, it seems like it ought to work, at least for the case of an update, all update groups consist of exactly one element. It's slightly more difficult to understand and think about and, and implement in code. The downside, however, is that assuming that it works, some mutex, most mutex implementations are not small. If you've got a billion elements and you're running on 64-bit Linux, you need 40 gigabytes to support all of your mutexes because uh, mutexes uh, uh, on, uh, uh, on, on Linux, 64-bit Linux, take 40 bytes, at least they do on my system. And if those mutexes happen to use futexes in the kernel and they all get touched at some point, you're going to have a billion futexes that the kernel needs to manage. So there's the question of resources. But that's not the problem. The problem is, what if you have, you're updating, you have two transactions, T0 and T1. T0 wants to update element E0, an E0's related group, and T1 wants to update element E1 and its related group. Well, what if E0's related group contains E1 and E1's related group contains E0, right? You have a mutual dependency. This is a trap. This is a recipe for deadlock. So having a tiny bit of experience with this, I knew at least to do a little bit of research in database concurrency algorithms. And I came across an approach that seemed to be uh, very well suited to this particular problem. And the approach is called strict timestamp ordering. It is one of many, many database con concurrency control algorithms. Uh, it's the only one I'm going to discuss. It is transactional and it is a timestamp based algorithm. Oh, that's great. So, what's a timestamp? Well, a timestamp is some variable that increases, usually it's an integer, that increases monotonically over time and it indicates the age of a transaction. So, a transaction begins and it is assigned a timestamp. A lower value timestamp indicates an older transaction just like birth year. A higher value timestamp indicates a newer transaction. Strict timestamp ordering uses timestamps to serialize concurrent transactions. And the principles are pretty easy. When each transaction begins, it gets a unique timestamp from some universally recognized single timestamp source. There's only one entity that hands out timestamps, right? In, in the case of this, it's an atomic integer. If two transactions are attempting to write to the same update group at the same time, the transaction that has the lower timestamp goes first. In other words, younger transactions always wait for older transactions. Older transactions never wait for younger transactions. They give up, i.e., they roll back and they try again. And, uh, you know, as I enter my early 30s, I like the idea of youngsters having to wait on me. Okay, one of the important principles of strict timestamp ordering is that the schedule of operations that occur 
are serializable and they are deadlock free. However, the potential price for this freedom from deadlocks is that of an older transaction having to roll back and try again. And you could have a situation where a transaction fails many times until it's able to actually complete its execution. So the completion of execution, uh, the completion of transactions is not deterministic. So to put just a little bit more rigor on it, let's suppose that we have a transaction, we'll call it TX0, that has some timestamp member variable called TSV, the timestamp value. And it will have functions begin, commit, and rollback, basic functions associated with the transaction. Let's assume that we have some element E0. E0 has a read timestamp and it has a write timestamp. There's some function update that that is going to attempt to perform some update to E0 and its, its uh, related group. There's some function read, which is going to attempt to read the state of E0. So, in classic strict timestamp ordering, let's assume that transaction TX0 wants to do a read. Okay? Well, if the transaction's timestamp is less than the timestamp of the last writer of the element, that means that a younger transaction has already written something to E0, and so the older transaction, TX0, is going to call rollback. It's going to give up and it's going to try again. If, however, uh, TX0's timestamp value is greater than the last writer, well, that means that TX0 is younger than the last guy that wrote to E0, and we're going to delay TX0 until TX1, the last transaction that wrote E0, is done. Now, TX1, the last guy to write to E0, he may have already been completed, and so the wait is a no-op, but it could also be in progress. In either event, we wait until the last guy that wrote the right timestamp is done, and then we go ahead and we update we do our update to E0. Let's suppose that we want to actually write. Well, this is slightly more complicated. If our timestamp value is less than the, the uh, timestamp value uh, of, the last, of the last reader, that means a younger transaction has already read from, from the element, and therefore he's depending on some state, some current state or older state. So we're going to roll back the transaction. Similarly, if the transaction's timestamp is less than the writer timestamp, again, a younger transaction has written E0, and just like with the read case, we're going to roll back the transaction and try again. If, however, our timestamp is greater than the last writer, that means we are a younger transaction, we're going to delay until the last guy is done, and then we're going to update E0 and we're also going to update e naught's timestamp. So in this way, this is classic STO, for both read operations and write operations, uh, younger, younger transactions wait for older transactions to complete, and if older transactions encounter a timestamp that's been written by a younger transaction, they roll back, they give up, and they try again. And in this way, TSO, uh, I'm sorry, STO uh, provides serializability and deadlock freedom. In our particular case, I didn't need the complex, because every operation in my situation was going to be a write operation, I didn't need to worry about the read case. So it made the logic and the implementation a little bit simpler. Again, all of the operations in my case were updates, so I only needed one timestamp el per element, timestamp value. So, and every operation was an update, so again, if my timestamp, the transaction's timestamp was less than the, the last timestamp, that meant a younger transaction had already written, so I roll back. If my timestamp was greater than the last write's timestamp, I wait, and again, the wait may be a no-op, because TX1 is already done. I update the element and the related group, and I move on. Any questions about that that I can answer quickly? Yes? So in your case of single element transaction, right? Yes. So uh, this update function, does it take care of updating all the other basic uh, elements in the function? For example, initially, 
So the, the implementation does. This is text that's sort of taken from a textbook. So this is sort of a generic description of the algorithm that you might read about. Yes? Does he have Google uh, in the first case reacquire the timestamp value if it's using only transactional documentation? Yes. It, by rolling back, it gives up and it begins a new transaction. And the, at the very first thing a transaction does when it begins anew is to get a new timestamp value so that it can now be a younger transaction and potentially uh, uh, win. All right, so a priori, I'm not going to tell you how I got here because it took me a few months. I'm going to tell you what the design choices are that I made at a high level. First, we need some basic synchronization primitives. And luckily, with modern C++, we have them. We've got a mutex, we've got condition variables, we've got atomic pointers, and very importantly, we have atomic compare and exchange. And this is, I think, critical for the algorithm's success. We also need a class that represents a lockable item or element. I'm going to call them items and elements. I'm going to use the words interchangeably from here on out. I also need a class that in some way represents a transaction. Somebody needs to take care of the bookkeeping for locking one or more elements, and that's the purpose of the transaction. So I also made the choice that threads share containers that hold the lockable items, right? It's a shared container shared amongst multiple threads. Threads will instantiate and own the transactions. The key member functions of a transaction, begin, acquire, commit, rollback, those member functions will only be called inside the thread that owns the transaction object. If you try crossing amongst threads, it becomes complicated, at least it did for me very quickly. Transactions uh, acquire these lockable items on behalf of their owning thread. Now, once the items are acquired, the owning thread implements the business logic to do the actual write operations to update uh, the, the related group of elements. I don't expect the transaction itself to know how to do that. So the transaction acquires, uh, i.e. locks, lockable items on behalf of the thread. The thread logic updates those items and then, uh, yes, it updates all of, it acquires the entire update group before it applies any write operation and then it either succeeds and commits or it fails and it rolls back. So what does the algorithm like this look like? Well, I, I wrote a little bit of pseudocode here before we jump into the C++. So here's what the thread function itself might look like at a high level. Our thread function receives as an argument in some sense a shared collection. This is a thing that's got the items in it that need to be shared. So we're going to instantiate a transaction object and we're going to reuse that transaction object as we loop. So while there is work remaining to be done, we're going to begin a new transaction. In other words, we're going to call the begin function on the transaction object. That's going to assign a new timestamp to it and reset all of its internal state. We're going to find the target element E inside the shared collection whether it's indexing in the case of a vector or maybe it's hashing in a hash table, in a linear hash table, somehow we're going to find that element E. We're not going to read it. We're not going to write to it. We're just going to, in effect, get a pointer to it. Now, at this point, we may have a priori knowledge about what the membership of the update group should be. We may not. If we do have knowledge about what the related elements are, the elements that are related to E, without actually having to read E, we can start adding things to the update group at this point. Maybe we have it, maybe we don't. Now, while there are update group members that remain unacquired, and while all of my acquisitions have succeeded so far, and as we jump into the loop, all of our acquisitions, all zero acquisitions have succeeded, beginning with E, we're going to attempt to acquire everything that's in the update group. So if you think about the update group, the very first element in the update group that needs to be acquired is E. Once we've acquired E, we've read E's internal state, maybe E 
can tell us more about the membership of the update group. Perhaps E has a list of indices or pointers that point to the other elements, which determine the update group. These are my friends. These are the guys that need to be updated when you update me. We don't know that. We can't know that until we acquire E and we're able to read it. We can't read E until we've acquired it. We'll do this until we've gotten, until we've computed the closure of the update group and we've been able to acquire some subset of that closure. Now, if we were able to acquire all the members of the update group, then we're going to apply the right operations to the members of the update group that need to be written. We're going to commit the transaction, and we're going to go back to the start and look for new work. However, if we were not able to acquire all of the members of the update group, that means somewhere we attempted to wait on a newer transaction and therefore we had to roll back. So we're going to roll back the entire transaction, we're going to loop back to the top and we're going to try again. Now, rolling back the transaction in, in this code doesn't really require a lot of work. We're not actually rolling back any updates to objects. We're not doing incremental updates to the objects as we're acquiring. We're only updating the objects after we've acquired all of the elements of the update group, which means rollback can be very simple, right? We just release a vector that has pointers to things that are in the update group. And we don't actually have to do any rollback writes or any uh, reverting writes to any elements that were part of the update group. Any questions about that so far? Yes? No, I don't have to update the timestamp values on any of the elements or any of the members of the update group because I haven't written to them yet. Remember, in this case, there's only one timestamp. It's a timestamp for writing. Because I've not written to the, any of the elements in the, in the update group, I don't need to adjust their timestamps. I only need to refresh the timestamp of the transaction when I get back to the top and I begin a new transaction. All right, so I'm going to go through, show some code. Uh, I've got a lot of code. Uh, hopefully, it'll be easy to understand. So here's a bunch of stuff that we need to actually make this work, a set of standard headers. Um, things that are important, I'm going to show it highlighted in yellow. These are the things which are actually directly applicable to the algorithm. There's other stuff that's supporting that may not be highlighted. So here, we've got a timestamp value type. I've defined it to be a uint64 because I want lots of timestamps. You can run out of 32 bits of timestamps pretty quickly these days. Uh, I've got a class which represents a transaction, a class which represents a base class for lockable items. I've got a little utility stopwatch thing that's based on std chrono. It's very simple, not much to look at. Lockable item is also very straightforward. In this particular system, I intend lockable item to be used as a base class, as a public base class for elements, some elements that are going to be locked. So there's, a, there's some accessor functions which are really just used for logging. Uh, they're not actually part of the algorithm. The important parts are the fact that I'm using an atomic pointer to a transaction as a data member of the lockable item. And this atomic pointer is going, to point to, is going to point back to the transaction object that owns this item. If this atomic pointer is set to null, that means nobody currently owns me, right? Only when this atomic pointer is set to some non-null value is this item owned by a transaction. And I'm going to keep my timestamp value. So the timestamp value of the last person that wrote to me. So importantly, when we the, the most important part of the code here is uh, the default constructor for this. These things, the, this is a base class and the elements that are derived from this are going to be put into a vector. So it's important that it get initialized correctly. So we're going to initialize the, the, the atomic pointer with the, uh, the null pointer and the last, trend, the last timestamp value was zero which we are treating zero as a special case of being the invalid, trans, uh, the invalid, invalid uh, timestamp value. 
So any valid timestamp value has to be greater than zero. All right, now we start getting into the meat of it. So this is our transaction class. And the important things are these four member functions, begin, commit, roll back, and acquire. And we're going to acquire a lockable item. We need to acquire a lockable item so that the, the surrounding thread can implement its business rules and update the elements of the update group and then commit or roll back accordingly. So, as is my habit from anybody that's seen my presentations, I like to do lots of type defs at the top so I can make things pretty in my element list. So, in this case, inside my transaction, I'm, I've got uh, an, an item pointer list, which is a, a, a standard vector that contains pointers to the lockable item base class. I've got a mutex. I've got a unique lock for mutexes. I've got a condition variable. And I've got an atomic, uh, I've got a, uh, an atomic, uh, an atomic integer of the timestamp value type. And here you see them implemented as members. Here's my atomic, uh, here's a regular timestamp value. Here's my list of, my vector of pointers to items that I've locked. Here are a mutex and a condition variable that I need to implement some of the locking. And this is my, this static variable is my universal source of timestamps. It's an atomic, uh, an atomic, uh, an atomic UNT 64T, and it's the guy that is going to generate new timestamps for me every time I need a new timestamp. And because it's static, of course, it's shared amongst all instances of transaction. And so here you can see I've just, uh, this is the bottom of the class. There's some logging functions that, that you'll see in the code which are implemented for tracing. Uh, but again, this is the important point. This is the, in some source code somewhere, in some source file, I've defined my static data member. And I've set its value to zero. So it's also invalid when it begins. So in my constructor for my transaction, I'm going to set my timestamp value to zero. I'm going to default construct everything. I've got a couple member variables here for logging. They're not important. And I'm going to anticipate that maybe I will lock as many as 100 items. And so I don't have to do any allocations when I'm running. I'm just going to go ahead and reserve space for those pointers in my, in my vector of, of pointers to items. My accessors, they're very straightforward. They're not used in the algorithm. So let's get to the important member functions. Begin. What does begin do? I've got a transaction t naught. I call the uh, t naught dot begin. What happens? Well, I'm going to log the fact that I began. That's not important. I am, however, I'm going to lock. I'm going to lock my own mutex inside my own thread. And while I've locked that mutex, I'm going to ask my atomic timestamp value generator to increment by one, and I'm going to put that value into my timestamp. So at the end of this operation, I now hold the next timestamp, right? Which means the very first transaction, the very first begin, the first one to win begins with a timestamp value of one. And then I'm going to unlock the mutex. Now you may ask, why am I locking and unlocking this inside my own thread? And what's more, why am I locking and unlocking access to a member variable when I'm using this atomic integer? It turns out to be important later on. So try and keep this in mind, and hopefully you'll see why this locking is in place. So let's look at commit. I'm going to log the commit. Again, I can, I'm only going, by convention, I'm only going to call commit inside my own thread, right? The thread that owns the transaction is the only entity that is the only place where commit is going to be called. Nevertheless, I'm going to lock my mutex. And while I have items on my list of pointers, I'm going to take the guy that's at the back of the list, which is a pointer to a lockable item. And because I own him, that lockable item is going to have a pointer that points back to me, indicating that I'm the owner of this lockable item. Now I'm going to release him, right? And how do I release him? I'm going to release him by atomically storing the null pointer into his into his member atomic pointer, right? So I am atomically saying, I release you. And now, once that has occurred, another transaction is free to come and attempt to atomically update that pointer 
in the lockable item and gain ownership of that lockable item, right? And then once I've released this lockable item, I'm going to pop it off the, the back of the vector and I'm going to keep going until I've, I've released all of the lockable items which I, as a transaction, have temporarily owned. When all of this is done, I'm going to take my condition variable. Remember, there was a condition variable that was a member of this class. And I'm going to notify anybody that might be waiting on this condition, hey, I'm done. You're now free to pursue things that I once owned, right? Now, at the bottom of the acquire algorithm, we'll see why this is necessary, right? There's kind of a relationship here, a triangular relationship between commit and begin and acquire. Uh, and it's kind of hard to explain them in linear order, so this is the order that I chose. So at the end, I notify anybody that may be waiting on me to complete, hey, I'm done. And remember, younger transactions wait on older transactions. So a younger transaction might be waiting on me. More than one younger transaction might be waiting on me. How do I notify all of those youngsters that I'm done? Through the condition variable. Okay, so we've looked at an algorithm in pseudocode, which is sort of the high-level uh, way that a thread might use this. Let's talk about acquire, because acquire, the acquire member function is really, in a sense, the star of the show here. And it's the one that's most subtle, and it took me a long time to figure out this. And to be truthful, I'm not absolutely sure that it's 100% correct. I've tested and tested it and beat on it and beat on it, and it seems to work. It seems to be deadlock-free. It seems to be race-free. That doesn't mean it's right. All right, so I've got this function, acquire. And acquire, uh, as you saw from the interface, it's going to receive a lockable item by reference in C++, but this is, this is pseudocode. So I'm going to attempt to acquire the item, and I'm going to loop. And I'm going to loop until I either succeed or I fail. If I succeed in acquiring the object, I'm going to return true, telling the caller, yep, I got him, he's good. If I fail, I'm going to return false. And then that other, that other loop that you saw in the thread logic will then know to bail and then roll back the transaction. So if I can acquire the item, if I acquire it, I'm going to add that item to the list of items that I own. Right? I got that vector, the list of things that I own. I'm going to add this guy to my list. Now, if my timestamp is newer than the, the timestamp of the last update to, that, uh, to the lockable item, that means I am a younger transaction than the transaction that last updated the lockable item. So I'm going to set that item's timestamp value to my timestamp, right? And because I've acquired him, I've locked him. And this doesn't need to be an atomic operation. It can just be an ordinary write. Because by convention, if I've acquired them, all the other transactions are going to respect that, and they are not going to write to that value. So I'm going to set the lockable item's timestamp to my timestamp, my transaction, and I'm going to return success. However, what if I acquire the item and uh, its timestamp is greater than mine, meaning that a younger transaction has updated it. All right, this is a failure. I'm going to return, and the caller can roll back. Well, there is a situation where in processing an update group, E may actually appear twice. And in early versions of my code, it did, right? So I needed to handle the case of, hey, what if I already own the item and I think I need to update it again, right? Well, I wasn't able to acquire it, but somehow I figured out, hey, I already own it. Okay, I'm going to return success and the caller can keep going, right? Well, what if I was not able to acquire the item and I don't already own it, right? This is the case where I'm going to wait until the current owner releases the item so that I can acquire it. So in one of those four clauses, uh, three of those clauses, I'm going to return success or failure. In the fourth clause, success or failure is indeterminate. I have to wait and try again. Eventually, at some point in the future, 
success or failure will be determined. Does that make sense? Any questions? Okay. All right, so, all right, so now let's see what this looks like in code. So here we're at the top of the function, the C++ function. We're going to take the lockable item by reference. And I'm going to flip back and forth between the pseudocode algorithm and the code. So now I'm at the point where, hey, I need to acquire the item and add it to the list of things that I already own. All right, so I'm going to set a transaction pointer, which is a local object, right? And I'm going to assign it to the null pointer. Then I'm going to take, uh, since I own, uh, since I don't own uh, the item, I'm going to attempt to gain ownership of it by attempting an atomic compare and exchange uh, with uh, the pointer, uh, the, the atomic pointer uh, that's a member of item. All right, so I'm going to take a brief detour. So remember, I've got, this is the, from uh, cppreference.com. So for an atomic T, in this case it's an atomic of a pointer transaction, the member function, the, the atomic member function is going to take a reference to a value that's called expected. It's going to take a, a, a value of the value that's desired. This is the thing that you want to put in it. So expected is the thing that you expect to find in the atomic value, in the atomic variable. Desired is the value that you want to put into the atomic variable, right? And I'm using compare exchange strong with sequential memory order. Don't ask me about it. I'm not an expert on it. I like the adjective strong better than weak, so this is the one that I picked. So the important thing is that this function atomically compares the representation, the pointer that's stored in the atomic pointer, with the value that's in expected. And if those two values are bitwise equivalent, and the language has changed recently, and as I said, I'm paraphrasing. If those two values are bitwise equivalent, then this function replaces the value that's in the atomic pointer with the value desired, right? And it returns true. It says, you expected to find some value inside of me. You f I found this value. In fact, it was in there. And because I found it, I'm going to take desired, this new value, and I'm going to put it inside. I'm going to hold that value for you. <coughs> However, if the expected value is not found inside the atomic pointer, then that actual value is going to be loaded into expected so that you can inspect it and false is going to be returned. So it's a way to atomically inspect the value of a variable and if the, va if the value that's in that variable, some I think of it as being a sentinel value, if the sentinel value is in the atomic variable, then I'm going to swap in a new value that I want to put in there. If the sentinel value is not inside the atomic variable, then I'm going to return false, and I'm also going to tell you what value was actually in there. And we're going to use this in the algorithm. So the sentinel value, in this case, is the null pointer. The null pointer indicates that an item is unlocked. It is unowned. So I'm going to look and see, does the, the lockable item contain the null pointer, right? And if it does contain the null pointer, I want you to swap that atomically with a pointer to me, me the transaction, right? If that succeeds, that means I have now placed a pointer back to me inside the lockable item, and now this indicates to any other transaction, which will have a different this pointer, it indicates to every other transaction that somebody else owns this lockable item, right? So I'm able to acquire him. I found the null pointer. He's unowned. I atomically swapped in a pointer to me. I own him. Great. I'm going to add him to the back of the list of things that I own. Having done that, now I want to check the timestamp value, right? I need to compare that to make sure that I am younger than the last, the last transaction that wrote to him. So I'm going to compare my timestamp value to his timestamp value. And if I am a younger transaction, I'm going to log success. I'm going to update his timestamp to my timestamp, and I'm going to return true. I acquired him. Yay, everything's good. If I was not able to acquire him, or I'm sorry, if I acquired him, but my timestamp is less than his timestamp, that means somebody newer has updated him, younger has updated him. And therefore, I'm going to log failure, and I'm going to return false, indicating 
I couldn't acquire him. A newer transaction has, has updated him already. All right. Well, let's go down to this, the second, uh, the last two of the four clauses, right? What about if I already own the item? Okay. Well, remember, if the, the compare exchange fails, the, that first value, that reference, gets updated with what was in the atomic, uh, ver, uh, the atomic pointer that was part of the lockable item. If that comes back and it's equal to my this pointer, that means, hey, I already own this lockable item. Sorry. Uh, I'm going to log a different kind of acquisition. Hey, I already own it, and I'm going to return true. It succeeded because I already own it. Now we get into the tricky case. I wasn't able to acquire him, and, it, and the person, the transaction that owns it is not me. It's another transaction. I'm going to have to do some waiting. So I'm going to log the fact that I'm waiting, and now I'm going to lock the mutex. Remember, uh, when the pointers were swapped into this variable, p cur tx, the current transaction, if it wasn't me, and it wasn't, if it was null, I would have acquired it. If it wasn't me, it must be a pointer to another transaction, right? Now I know who owns it, right? Because I know who owns it, and it's a sibling of mine, I'm going to reach inside and I'm going to lock his mutex. I'm going to attempt to acquire the lock that's inside of the mutex, that's in, I'm going to attempt to acquire the mutex that's inside the transaction that currently owns the item. Then, uh, I'm going to remember that the, the, the timestamp value inside the lockable item was an atomic variable. So I'm going to retrieve his value, uh, I'm sorry, the, the pointer. I'm going to retrieve the pointer that's inside the lockable item. So I've gotten what I think is the transaction from the atomic swap. Now I'm going to look inside the item itself, and I'm going to retrieve the, the pointer that the item thinks owns it, right? And if these two things are the same, because between here and here they might have changed, if the item confirms that he is in fact owned by that other transaction, then I'm going to look at his timestamp. I'm going to look at the timestamp value of the other transaction and determine if he is younger than me. Who is locking something that's protecting the transactions themselves that you're reaching into? All of the locking is done here inside the transactions. Transactions themselves at a higher level are never locked. They're always existing? They exist, each individual transaction exists inside an owning thread. So you've got a this pointer, what if, since you've got that this pointer, that thread's now gone, the this pointer's invalid. So the question is, what happens if the thread which purports to own the lockable item has gone away? Well, that's a very good question. And, um, you know, I've not encountered that, and I guess I'm going to punt that and say TBD, right? I'm not sure. That, that gets into a larger error handling strategy. It might be implementation specific, too. And it could be implementation specific, too. Sorry. It sounded like he was um, asking a question about if the thread that owns the transaction goes away. But what if the, tra the, the transaction exists for the entire lifetime of the thread? The thread just sits in the transaction until it's actually finished with? The transaction object in this model is reused multiple times. So there is one transaction object, and when you, when you call begin on the transaction, it, it resets all of its internal state, assigns the next, the next timestamp value, and everything begins afresh. Right? I, guess I have a similar question about the items themselves. OK. Um, they get put into the transaction's number of vectors. So pointers to the lockable items are added to the internal list that's kept inside the transaction so that the transaction knows who are the members of my update group. Okay, and um, I guess the, the lifetime of, a, of an item there in case it exists for uh, the lifetime of the transaction. Yes, so I guess there's an underlying assumption here which I did not state, and that is the shared container has a lifetime which exceeds that of any of the threads which 
uh, have instantiated transactions that update that. So the container begins and is initialized and is ready to go before any threads that implement transactions are created. And then likewise, all of those threads must die and then the container is then, you know, destroyed. Okay, so does that mean that a transaction could not remove an item from the container? That's a good question. We'll come back to that. Uh, remind me if I forget. Okay. So, the, the, lock, the, the lockable item thinks that its owning transaction is in fact the transaction that was returned from the atomic uh, compare and exchange. Now, if the owning transaction is younger than me, he has a higher timestamp value, then I have failed, I'm going to return false and fall back. However, if I am younger than him, I'm going to wait on his condition variable. This is the key point. I'm going to wait on the condition variable that is a member object inside the transaction that owns the lockable item. Now, let's pretend for a second that in all of this code, we were in transaction T0. T0 is attempting to acquire this. And let's pretend for the sake of argument that the owning transaction is, is T1, right? So T0 is waiting on T1, all right? How does this play out? Let's go back to commit. And now let's pretend that we are in transaction T1, right? T1 is, you know, T0 is waiting on the condition variable, right? Well, T1 is doing this and that, and then when T1 is ready to commit, he locks his mutex, he goes through, he releases from ownership all of the lockable items, and then he broadcasts on his condition variable, hey, anybody that's waiting on me, I'm done. This is how a transaction notifies other transactions that are waiting on it, that it is completed and all of its lockable items have been released. That is the secret sauce in the algorithm. So, T1 has broadcast to all of the waiters, which include T0, it's broadcast, I'm done, continue. Let's go back to T0. Now we're back in the bottom of acquire for T0. Okay, my waiting is done, I've reacquired the mutex, I'm going to come back up again, and I'm going to check, I'm going to double check, uh, in order to avoid spurious wakeups from condition variables, I'm going to check again. I'm going to go up and check to make sure that T1 no longer owns the lockable item. Of course, we expect that to be the case. We're going to fall out of the loop. We're going to go back up to the top, and we're going to try again. That is the acquire algorithm. So the subtlety, the subtlety is really in the interplay between when transaction T0 needs to wait on transaction T1, and when transaction T1 finishes his commit, and he releases all of the transactions that are waiting on him. That is the subtlety in the algorithm. Yes? Uh, can you please go back to the previous step? Uh, what if uh, the transaction T1 notified uh, all the waiters before we stated wait? And uh, the transaction T1 is not used anymore. This means that we are waiting forever. Hmm. Yes, that's a good point. I don't have an answer for that right now. Isn't that taken care of by the fact that you're acquiring the mutex from the, from the current transaction? That's not the case of the transaction. Yeah, I'm, I'm not sure about that. That's a very good question, though. Uh, somebody in the back? Chandler. Okay. So All right. However, there, there is a bigger problem here. What happens if the T1 goes away after that weight returns? 
goes away in what sense? Is he allocated? We have no answer. So this is a case where, where a transaction is finished. It notifies everything. Right. And then it is finished, and so it is destroyed. So there's an assumption that that doesn't occur in this. Transac transactions are not allocated. They're members inside thread function. And there's well, sure, I answered that question earlier. Right now, for purposes of, uh, for these purposes, there's an assumption that all of the threads begin, have a lifetime that's, that is roughly equivalent. And, um, but it can't be roughly equivalent. Like you can't have a single thread in this lifetime while the transaction is running. As soon as you do, this, this, this has a use after free. Right. So in the, in the way that I've implemented it, all of the threads, so all of the threads wait to, to uh, effectively <coughs> exit their thread functions at the same time. Again, this is not in production. This is, this is for purposes of trying to get to an algorithm that works. But, but, but the point is well taken about if the, thread, if the thread does die and a transaction goes away, yes, that's a problem. Yeah, well, as I said earlier, the, the, the logging is for tracing and debugging purposes. It's actually unimportant to the operation of the algorithm. You mean the top branch? So, so I've done the compare and exchange. I, re I return the value inside pcur tx, which is ostensibly the current owning transaction. And now I've come down here, and I'm comparing that to this to see, am I the owning transaction? Yeah. But, but after that fails, okay. All right, so I've now locked it. Now you have it. the infinite loop that was mentioned previously, because now you lock it and you go condition wait. That transaction's not doing anything anymore. Well, wait a minute. If, if that transaction has already committed, if that <coughs> transaction has already committed, then for that transaction to commit inside the lockable item, inside the lockable item, the, that pointer inside the lockable item to the owning transaction has now been set to null which means it is going to compare unequal to p cur tx. OK, OK. So you're just, you just have use after free bus here. OK. OK. All right. So how did I test this? So my test strategy was to create functions that update some collection of shared items, uh, some straw man problem. Um, I couldn't use the problem that I did at work because that's proprietary. I wanted to make sure that my shared items were written in such a way that it was possible to create a data race. And what's more, if I created a race, it could be detected. So I wanted to measure, first of all, for performance reasons, I wanted to measure what's the cost of doing updates to this thing just in a single thread. No concurrency, no transactions. What's the cost? Then what I wanted to do was do some multi-threaded updating in such a way that I'm attempting to actually induce data races into my shared item to, to verify that, in fact, races can occur. Because if the races occur, if I can make races occur and they don't occur when I apply the algorithm, that gives me some evidence that maybe the algorithm is working correctly. So as another point of performance measurement, I wanted to measure the multi-threaded updates guarded by a single critical section. I didn't attempt to do sharding in this problem, uh, in these measurements. And then finally, I wanted to measure the performance of the multi-threaded transactional updates. So what did I need to do this? 
Well, here are some forward declarations. Uh, I'm going to create a test item in which I can induce races. I'm going to keep, uh, for purposes of, 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 of implementing a shared collection, I'm going to put those into a std vector. I'm going to keep an index of elements, which are indexes into that vector. And then I've got some, some types here that I'm going to use to generate random numbers. So let's look at what test item is. So test item is publicly derived from my lockable item. It's got some, some character buffer which it stores locally. I didn't want to use string or anything where allocations might be involved. I just wanted to have a simple character of buffer, uh, buffer of characters. And there are two update functions. The update functions are actually identical. They only differ by the first argument for logging purposes. The, the actual operation of the functions themselves is the same. So let's look at one of the update functions, stUpdate, uh, for single-threaded. I've got, I'm going to create a local buffer of characters that's the same size as the buffer of characters that's part of the lockable uh, of the test item. I'm going to create string views that, I'm going to create a string view that refers to the local character buffer and a string view that refers to the shared character buffer. And I've got a hasher, I'm going to, I'm going to hash strings using string views, right? So what I'm going to do is I'm going to loop through the buffer and I'm going to use this, uh, I'm going to use the random number generator and the random number distribution from the last two uh, parameters to generate random character values. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to generate those values, I'm going to assign it into the shared buffer, and at the same time I'm going to assign it into the local buffer, right? Once I'm done doing this, I'm then going to hash the shared view, and I'm going to hash the local view. Now, between the time that this loop begins and the time that this comparison ends, or the second hash function is done, there is a window there where some other thread could potentially be updating the buffer in the shared lockable item. And so it's this time window between the beginning of this loop and the end of this if statement where, um, where a data race can occur. So the question is, can I make data races occur in this case? And the way I'm detecting it is by keeping a local copy of what I think the new set of characters could be, and I'm relying on hash to quickly tell me, you know, are they the same or not? Uh, the TX update, the functions, the, is exactly the same. The only difference is that in this case, when a transa I'm using this in a transactional case, for logging, I'm going to log the ID of the, of the transaction itself. So let's look at some tests uh, for, uh, for exercising this. First is this very simple single-threaded single element access test. Here I'm going to generate some, some stuff necessary to generate random numbers. Uh, particularly, I'm going to, uh, I have three distributions. One distribution for generating uh, random indices, a uniform distribution of random indices inside my list of items, a random, uh, a random number generator for generating some number of references. This number of references it actually refers to the number of elements that are part of the update group. So for example, uh, the size of my container might be a million elements, and in all of my tests, the size, the parameter refs count is 20, meaning that the size of the update group is a random number between 1 and 20 exclusive or inclusive. And then finally, there's a random number generator for generating characters. So I'm going to start a stopwatch, and then I'm going to update. I'm going to do some updates. So inside my loop, first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to clear out my list of indices. The indices, the, in, the list of indices are the indices inside the, inside the collection of items that represent my, my update group. So I'm going to, uh, so you can see, I set the maximum number in the distribution as part of the argument. And now inside the loop, I'm just reusing that variable to some random number. So in my tests, refs count is going to be a random number between 1 and 20. Now I'm going to compute, since I have a priori, a priori knowledge, I'm going to compute the members of my update group. So Whatever this refs count is, some random number from 1 to 20, 
I'm going to then compute a random number, I'm going to compute a random index into the collection based on that. So I'm going to have 1 to 20 indices which are distributed uniformly across a million possible elements. So that simulates an update group whose size and membership changes from operation to operation. And I'm going to save that list of indices on the back of, of my list of indices. Because I'm then going to walk through a loop. I'm going to pull out the latest index from my list of indices. In my list of items, then I'm going to call the stUpdate function on it, and I'm going to update, I'm going to update that member of the update group. And then finally, I'm going to stop the stopwatch and, and print a message. So this is the simple single-threaded case. Hopefully that makes sense. Every, the, all of the numbers, the, the, the number of elements in the update group and the actual members of the update group are generated randomly every time through the loop. Yes? Shouldn't the uh, item index be an arrow and not a cell? Unless you're allocating them continuously? No, they are, they are being allocated as objects. Right. This, sorry, the, uh, the item list. In this case, item list is a vector of test item. Test item is a class that's publicly derived from lockable item. So it's owning the test items by value. Okay, so we went through the single threaded element access test. So this test, the multi-threaded element access test, is designed to test the single cr critical section idea. So we've got a static mutex member, which is going to, we're going to use for our critical section. Again, I've got the machinery for generating random numbers, and the loop is very similar. I'm going to generate some random number representing the number of elements in the update group. I'm going to compute the membership of the update group using these random numbers. Now the twist here is I'm going to lock the mutex. I'm then going to update the members of the group, and I'm going to unlock the mutex. So this is my single critical section. All the threads are going to block on this, right? And I'm going to do it again until I'm done. The transactional element test, this is where I'm going to test the transactional algorithm, or an implementation of the transactional algorithm applied to this particular problem. Again, very similar random number generation. The difference, though, is this, t this function, TS access test, this is a thread function, just like MX access test was a thread function. So inside this thread function, I'm going to instantiate a transaction object. And this just uh, corresponds to log level one, it's unimportant, and a file pointer that I'm using for logging, right? That's not important. I also have a Boolean variable, which I'm going to use to tell me whether or not I have acquired all of the members that I want, all of the members of the update group. So. This, is, this corresponds to that part of the algorithm near the top where I've created my transaction object and it's going to be reused inside the event processing loop. Okay, once again, randomly computing the size of the update group. Once again, randomly computing the membership of the update group. Here's where it gets interesting. Now I'm going to begin the transaction and I'm going to say, I'm going to set acquired to true because I've acquired everything that I've attempted to acquire so far. So, of course, it's true. Now I'm going to enter a loop, and I'm going to first attempt to acquire all of the members of the update group, right? So my loop condition is as long as acquired is true, and there's still members of the group, meaning that my index is less than my reference count, I'm going to grab the index of the next member, and I'm going to update my Boolean variable by uh, logically ending it with the result of attempting to acquire that. Does that make sense? So if I have acquired all of the elements that I expect to acquire at the end of this loop, the value of the Boolean variable acquired will be true. If that has failed for any of them, then if this returns false, then the value of and is false, which means acquired becomes false. We come up to the top of the loop and we'll drop out, right? But if, it acquire, if tx.acquire always succeeds, then the Boolean variable acquired will end up being true. If it's true, then I'm just going to loop, going to go into the loop. In this case, I'm calling the tx update member function 
uh, which is the same as the other update member function, except if it needs to, if it detects a race, it, it logs the ID of the transaction. Once all of the updates are done, I'm going to commit. If I was not able to acquire them, then no harm, no foul. I haven't updated any members of the update group. I'm going to roll back the transaction, and I'm going to, uh, whoops. I'm going to roll back the transaction and go back to the top and try again. Any questions? Make sense? Okay. Finally, there is a test driver, a main test driver function that's called from main. Uh, I keep a list of, of futures, of, uh, futures parameterized by void. These represent the threads. Uh, there are four different modes. Mode zero is just the single baseline. There, the, the TX update function, or the ST access test function is called from the thread that owns main. It's the baseline, it represents the fastest possible performance we could get, no concurrency. Um, mode one is that in which we're attempting to use the transactional algorithm. So I'm here, I'm pushing back a future where I've called standard stood async and I've, I've bound a, I've, done, I've used stood bind to bind the thread function to it to launch the threads. And at the end of this, I just wait for all of the threads to cease execution. And all of the threads cease execution when they run out of things to do. Oops, I'm sorry. Uh, mode two is almost exactly the same as mode one, except this is where I'm testing uh, the single criti critical section uh, uh, test with the MX access test function. Otherwise, it's the same. And then finally, mode three, this is where, this is, I think, interesting because here I'm, I'm instantiating multiple threads, but I'm using the single-threaded access test. Now, in this case, with the single-threaded access test, there is no locking, no concurrency of any sort, but I'm, I'm implementing multiple threads. So now here is a situation where I could possibly induce races inside the lockable items. Right? I'm deliberately trying to do that. And that's what mode three represents. And again, when they run out of work to do, I wait and I'm done. All right, so let's look at some test results. So let's start with something easy and we'll, we'll tighten it up. Let's begin with a list of 10 million test items in a vector. And I'm going to, each thread is going to execute 1 million transactions. The maximum number of members of the update group is going to be 20. So 1 to 20 members, uh, the number randomly generated of the update group for each transaction, from 1 to 8 threads, right? And 0 in these graphs, 0 represents the single-threaded baseline case. So this is where the single-threaded baseline case from the calling thread of main. One thread means the single threaded case where there's a thread that's been spawned, otherwise it's identical. Two, three, four, five, all the way up to eight. So duration on the left, the blue line represents the average amount of time that each thread took to complete its transactions. And the gray line on the right, races, this represents the number of races that I was able to detect during that execution. So you can see for zero and one threads, well, in both of these cases, the, the, the single-threaded access case called from main and the single-threaded access case where it's, it's spawned from a thread, there are no races because there's only one thread. But when we get to two and greater threads, you can see that we start seeing some races. And the number of races that we see grows as the number of threads increases. Sort of makes sense. Right? Yes? This duration here is specified in the eight thread Yes. So when you have eight, you're doing eight times more threads? No. When I have, this is the average time that each, each thread took to execute a million transactions. So in the case where there were eight threads, each thread took uh, 4,300 milliseconds. So you're doing eight times as much work? Yes. Together. Yes, you're doing eight times as much work. This is the average time per thread. 
So as you would expect, more threads, more possibility of collision, more collisions means more rollbacks, more overhead. You expect the time to, to go up. Let's look at the case, same counts, 10 million items, 1 million transactions, up to 20 refs, up to eight threads, guarded by mutex. Well, this is almost, this is such a beautiful line, it's exactly what you'd expect. In the case of, of in the simple cases where there's only one thread, you get pretty good performance. In fact, this performance is the same for all of these tests, right? But as you start adding threads, because everything is, is, is constrained by a single critical section, you see a very nice linear relationship in the amount of time that each thread takes, right? It's exactly what you would expect when everything feeds through the bottleneck of a single critical section. So it's kind of a confirmation in a sense that things are working the way they ought to be working. Well, let's look at the case of transactional updates. For the transactional graphs, it's the same thing, duration on the left with the light blue line. On the right-hand side are the number of rollbacks that occurred. And you'll notice that I haven't listed races because no races occurred. No races were detected. In fact, in all of my tests, I'll just jump to the finish line. In all of these tests where I attempted to induce races or induce and detect races, in, the trans in all of the transactional cases, no races were detected. And I've actually run this test with much bigger numbers on a much beefier machine where I work, and I've not been able to detect any races yet. Doesn't mean that they can't occur and Chandler pointed out something that I should probably go back and look to make sure that that case is covered. So far, I've not been able to induce a race. Well, as you, you kind of expect, as the number of threads goes up, the likelihood of rollbacks occurs because now you have the possibility of, of, of uh, peer transactions competing for a given element. It's all randomly generated, right? But it does occur, even with 10 million elements. So the nice thing is that as the number of rollbacks increases, the performance de decrease in the per thread time uh, to, to actually do the work doesn't grow at the same rate. It grows at a relatively lower rate, which is kind of a pleasing result. At least in this case, on this machine, four cores, eight hyper cores, so you see nice behavior at, up until the point where all hyper cores are engaged, right? Uh, I've gotten a graph at the end that shows what happens when you go beyond that number, which is, it has the behavior that you would expect. All right, so let's make things a little bit tighter, right? Let's bring down the number of items and thus increase the possibility of races and the possibility of rollbacks. All right, so let's reduce by a factor of 10. I've got a million items now, a million transactions, up to 20 members of the update group, again, up to eight threads. Well. Interestingly enough, the performance curve looks about the same and is roughly the same value. But you can see as the number of items has, has shrunk, but all the other factors have remained the same, the number of races has increased in this case, right? There are fewer items now. There's more likelihood that races are going to occur. And this is the case where I'm looking for data races, right? I have fewer, uh, fewer total items but everything else is the same, so the probability of inducing a race on a given item is now higher. And that's what we see, the number of races increases. The single-threaded mutex performance, basically the same. The multi-threaded transactional updates, well, you can see, now there's a little bit of a jump now, and I'm not sure why this occur has occurred from, or I'm, actually, I know why it's occurred because now I've implemented transactional logic in here, whereas the single-threaded access case doesn't have that. So even though there's only one thread, that thread still has to go through doing transactions, and there's some overhead associated with that. So you can see we've gone from about 2,900 to maybe almost 3,500. So that's roughly, I don't know what, about a 15% overhead to, to manage the transactions. Uh, but the, the, the growth of the line with the number of threads is still relatively flat, compared to the increase in the number of rollbacks, right? So that's a pleasing graph. Let's tighten it up some more. Let's go to 100,000 items. Let's look at the race-inducing case. You can see on the right-hand side, the number of races is going up. This time it's getting pretty significant, and we're also starting to get sort of a nice smooth curve here, right? The 
single mutex, again, very similar behavior. And finally, the transactional updates. Very nice performance in terms of the, the, uh, the duration, per thread duration for the transactional locking. You can see we also starting to get a nice smooth curve for the number of rollbacks that occur. Again, because we're competing for items. Let's really tighten it up. The hardest case, 10,000 items, a million transactions, 20 refs, up to eight threads. In the race-inducing case, you can see the performance, you know, the threads don't care whether or not they're inducing races. Their performance is almost identical in each of these cases. But now you can see the number of races just really goes up. At eight threads, you know, for a million transactions in this case, there are, uh, I don't know, around 50,000, 52,000 races that have, have been induced over the course of a million transactions. Critical section curve, very similar. And then finally, the transactional curve. Now in this case, things are so tight, the number of rollbacks has actually gotten pretty big. We're up near 100,000, but still, the, the performance curve for the transactional updates is not growing. I take solace in the fact that it's not growing as quickly as the curve which uh, denotes the number of rollbacks. So I'm pretty pleased with the performance of this so far. And again, in all of these graphs, in all of these cases where I'm showing you the results of the transactional algorithm, I have been unable to induce, I've been unable to detect a race in all those cases. Doesn't mean they can't occur and it doesn't mean the algorithm is correct, but so far I've been unable to detect one. If someone is able to detect one, please let me know. And just as a quick comparison, for the case of 10,000 items, which is the most difficult case, I thought it might be amusing to show the performance of the single critical section case versus that of the transactional updates. And you can see that uh, in the critical section case, because there's overhead associated with transaction locking, which is slightly larger than that that you have in the mutex, the single critical section performance is very slightly better than that of the transactional case. But when you get to two threads and beyond, there's no contest. Uh, let's see. Oh, yes. So the final graph that I alluded to before is this was a machine where there was basically eight cores that could work. And I wanted to see what happened when I went beyond eight cores. What was the effect of thread contention in the operating system, right? So you can see, right, when we go from eight to nine, there's kind of an inflection point, which is, you know, sort of interesting behavior. It kind of confirms your intuition about what happens when you have more threads than cores. Any questions about the graphs? Yeah. Did you see a similar spike up um, when you were running at work with you know more physical cores? As soon as you hit that first logical core, you would start to see that spike. You know, I don't recall. I don't recall. But you're right. There does appear to be a little bit of an inflection point there, doesn't there? You know, so we've got four cores at this point, and then. There seems to be a bigger jump between four and five than there is between three and four. Yeah, yeah. That could very well be. Okay, so quickly, summary. You know, these are preliminary things. They operate on containers and elements, but they don't require changing the containers themselves. I think creating a transactional container is a difficult, if not impossible, task. Or if you do do it, in the case of building a database index or something like that, it's you know, it's bespoke, it's, it's purpose-built. There's an underlying assumption here that the container's internal structure is unchanged while transactions are in progress. In other words, the vec a vector resize cannot occur while transactions are in progress. Uh, I'm not sure about what happens if you were trying to do this with the, with the noded containers, you know, uh, iterators and pointers to elements stored in nodes in one of the associative, the ordered associative containers don't change when you add and remove elements to the container, but other internal state does change. The, the child links, for example, in the red-black trees. I'm not sure whether that, that affects this or not. 
One thought that occurred to me, however, is if you wanted to be able to update, uh, change the shape of a container while transactions are in progress, this might be a case where a reader's writer's mutex actually works. So at the beginning of every transaction, it attempts to acquire the reader's side of that mutex. When somebody needs to change the shape of the, uh, the algorithm, maybe by resizing a vector, it attempts to acquire the right side of the reader's writer's locks. When the transactions are done, they release the reader's side and if they have to wait on a writer, eventually the writer gets the lock. He can change it. He releases the write lock, and all the readers, the transactions can begin again. So far in my tests, I've just used std vector because it's easy. The maximum number of elements is pre-allocated and resizes don't occur. If you wanted to build a container that's resizable, which is something that I actually did for work, the way I did it is I created a homegrown hash table using std vector. Each element of the vector was a hash bucket. I called it lockable hash bucket. The hash buckets themselves had member functions for adding, finding, and erasing elements. So if I wanted to add an element to the collection, I figured out which hash bucket it belonged to, then I acquired the hash bucket, and then I updated the hash bucket. And in that way, I was able to add elements or remove elements from the entire collection. Uh, and with a good hash function, you know, its lookup time can be fast, not as good as direct indexing. Well, one of the problems, so one possible problem is that threads could, threads could starve, right? There's always the, the probability that, possibility that a thread that's running transactions could get starved. And in this case, transactions might become stale. I don't attempt to account for that. I'm not sure what other container types might be amenable to this approach. Finally, there's lots of room for more work. This is very preliminary. Uh, I developed this. It seemed like it worked. I wrote a bunch of tests. It seemed to pass the tests. I thought it would make for an interesting talk. I would present it to the crowd. And if people have thoughts or they want to take it and make it better, I think that would be great. Questions? Because by acquiring, sorry, if I acquire the hash bucket, I have exclusive access to it. But is there not going to be, it seems like to me there's going to be a lot of potential for interactions between that and the locking of the transaction bit, the, the, you know, the locking of the elements themselves. Well, in this case, in this case, the hash bucket, the hash bucket is the element that is locked. And the actual elements are hidden inside the hash bucket. So, I lock the hash bucket, but I never actually lock the elements. And my theory was is that I could use this to add and remove elements from the overall collection, right? And by picking a good hash tape, uh, a good hash table size, the number of elements in each bucket, on average, is going to be about one. So it's almost as fast as direct indexing. So I'm locking the hash bucket, but not the individual elements. Yes, so elements can be removed as part of the update of a transaction. And part of that update logic is making sure that removal of an element in a given hash bucket is consistent with anything else in any other hash bucket that might be relying on it. In fact, in acquiring the, that hash bucket, that hash bucket is member of the update group. And let's assume that it's element E, the thing that needs to be updated, right? I've acquired that, I, I've acquired the hash bucket, now I've looked at the element that's stored in the hash bucket. This element has relationships to other elements. I go to their hash buckets, I acquire all of them. Once I've acquired all of the set, I've computed the closure, I've acquired all of the hash buckets that might be affected, then I can delete E inside the first hash bucket and I can make sure all the other hash buckets are updated accordingly so that everybody is consistent. Once that's done, then I commit. Any other questions? Charlie. So the, the atomic clock you have is a shared resource that generates a unique value each time. 
um, monotonically yeah. increasing shared value, uh, yes, monotonically, monotonically increasing, increasing value. Shared value. Right. So, so if you change the design to where um, it's not directly shared, it's indirectly shared, so you're not coordinating that atomic increase. Uh, is this algorithm, do you think, tolerant of two transactions that start at the same time point? No. By definition, a transaction, in this algorithm, a transaction must have a unique timestamp value. Two transactions that have the same timestamp value is, is, a, is an error. Chandler. Uh, two questions. One, have you done any comparison with uh, other concurrent container data structures like set building blocks or other implementations? No. No, I have not done those comparisons yet. Uh, I researched several multi, uh, several database concurrency algorithms. I was actually, from a previous job, familiar with multi-version concurrency control, which works very well on tree-like structures where you have seven orders of magnitude more reads than writes, and you can swap things in atomically. That didn't seem to work for this. Um, so the, the comparisons that you saw as part of the results are the ones that have been done to date. Did I try testing with thread sanitizer? No, I did not. OK. Any other questions? Uh, yes, sir. Uh, you, you call notify all uh, at one point in the code. Yes. And then you notify all waiting threads to uh, go check and see if they're the next one that can go. Yes. Um, would it be a performance improvement to call notify one rather than notify all? And then, because only one thread is actually going to get to go. So I thought about that, and my reasoning for, a, so the question is why use notify all instead of notify one? Could notify one provide a performance improvement? So my thinking was in applying notify all, it may be a performance pessimiz pessimization, yes. But in principle, when the transaction is done and it commits, right, at the very last thing step it commit, what that transaction T1 needs to do is he needs to tell everybody I'm done so that everybody can then go back and attempt to acquire that atomic variable, right? When they go back to the top of the loop, they're attempting to do that atomic compare and exchange so that one of them will win and, and become the owner of the lockable item. I didn't see any benefit to only allowing one to do that. And plus, when the, when the, the other, reason that I did it is when the transaction is done, there's no reason to, if there's more than one waiter, there's no reason to release only one. What are they waiting around for anymore? If I release only one at some point in the future, I have to release everybody else that's waiting. So to me, it seemed that it made sense. I just release everybody. You know, if I release only one and then I've updated to a new timestamp value the next time I, I'm doing a new transaction, what are the other threads waiting for? They're waiting for something that's never going to happen until I notify again for my current transaction, right? Yeah, but, the, but if, if, there, if only one gets to, go, gets to actually do real work anyway, then the others are going to check and say, oh, I still can't work. Well, so that's, that's not true. The, the others may be in a situation where their timestamp value is such that they can acquire it, or if they can't acquire it, they can roll back. So by releasing all of them, they can attempt to acquire it, Somebody will win, right? Those that lose will be able to roll back and try again. They'll be able to get further down the line than they would if they were all waiting on the condition variable. I'm not sure that's the right decision, but that's the decision I made and that's the reasoning behind it. Other questions? All right, everybody, thanks for coming. My code will be up on GitHub uh, sometime later today and, and there's my blog. Thank you for attending.